All right, I'm going to give you, I think I got 11 more movies, and these are movies that made me. Uh, again, if you don't know what movies that made me uh, is, these are not my favorite movies. These are movies that uh, are kind of a checkpoint in my life, right? They, they are extremely important to me for one reason or the other. It's usually like a big memory. Um, it could be like, my, you know, my first scare that I ever had. Or, you know, the first time I cried in a movie, that could, that could qualify. So this is going to be fun. All right? This is going to be fun. I had a blast doing it last week because it was kind of like a trip down memory lane, too, which was cool. Okay? I will say, too, there is one movie on this list that I have only seen once. <laughs> but it's a memory, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay? All right. Uh, and most of these movies I love to death. Okay? All right. So... Uh, by the way, this is not a ranking. This is not a top 10. This is just, you know, each the number one is not going to be the number one on this list. It's just a random list. Okay. Random list. All right. Um, so, you know, I'll start you off with a bang. Boom. Halloween four. I've talked about Halloween four ad nauseum. Um, the reason it's on this list uh, is because it's the movie that got me into the franchise that, that made me the obsessed fan of, uh, to this day, I think I've been chasing the feeling that I got from Halloween four ever since, and I'll never get it. I'll never, ever, as much as I love some of the other sequels, I will never, ever, um, be as full as I was after Halloween four. Uh, I had nightmares about Myers for literally years after watching this movie. It, it fucked me up and I loved the story. I loved the movie. I loved the, um, Dr. Loomis. Um, I loved Rachel and Jamie. It just, it, it just hit me so hard. And I remember just sitting in the theater after this scene and just being like, wow, movies can do that. You know, to most people, it's like the fourth movie in a franchise and it did, this movie did nothing for them, but I was 15 years old. And to me, it changed my life. It really did. And as crazy as that sounds, this movie literally changed my the trajectory of my life. Uh, you know, I, I, before let's put it this way. This, this will sum up how profound this movie was. Okay. There was before I saw Halloween movie, uh, Halloween four in the theater. And then there was the second after. Okay. The second before the movie started, I wasn't a Halloween fan. The second after the movie ended, the Halloween franchise was my favorite franchise. Okay. That's how profound Halloween four is. It was that crazy. And, um, if I had to put, if I had to name a number one, as far as the impact that the movie had on me, this would be my number one. All right. I'll start you off with that. It was a, I get chill bumps right now. Just talking about that experience, you know, packed theater opening night, 1988, and the, that crowd, you know, I was just talking about the size of a crowd does matter. That crowd was so freaking into this movie. They were scared to death. And when Loomis does his, no, no, and then you see her, I, I just, I still to this day remember this deafening gasp. The whole crowd was like, oh my God. Like everybody was just like freaking out. Like, can you believe that? It's, well, I've been chasing Halloween 4 ever since. I will never get it again. Okay. Next one. Next one. All right. Movies that made me, people. Jaws. Um, a lot of memories of Jaws. Uh, just, you know, I was too young to see it in the theater in 75. I was two years old. But I just remember... Um, watching this movie pretty much yearly uh, from a certain age up until now. Every year of my life, I have watched Jaws. It might be the the movie that I've watched the most in my life. Seriously. Sometimes I watch it twice a year. I would say Jaws, like a lot of movies, um, uh, well, I don't want to say a lot of movies, but you know, there's a select few movies that are just like a warm blanket. And no matter how many times you throw it in, uh, it just feels like the first time. I don't know. There's just like, it's one of the few movies that I could watch directly after watching it the first time. It, 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 the characters are so good and so rich 
And we'll never have a shark movie again that can even touch Jaws. It's impossible almost at this point. Um, And maybe, you know, people give a lot of credit to a lot of different things for Jaws. But one thing that I don't hear people mentioning um, as much is Peter Benchley. Uh, who wrote the the novel? He wrote such great characters, uh, and you didn't see the shark for most of the movie, but you were terrified. And it has one of my all time favorite openings of any any movie, not just horror movie. Period. The opening with Chrissy being attacked by Jaws. I mean, as far as like setting a tone of a of a movie and what t- what this movie was going to be like, you know, because at face value, when you think of a shark attack movie. It could go either way. It could be like a kind of a, a lighthearted, fun, like comedy, almost comedic type movie, even though you're being eaten by a shark. But it was serious. From that opening scene, That it was terrifying watching what happened to Chrissy and just the way they directed that scene, yanking her body back and forth. Um, you know, there's been so many openings to horror movies where you get zero payoff. I just saw this movie, uh, The Black Demon, the, the, the shark movie. And th- this movie, like so many other movies, was just a cutaway. That's what they do. They show the, the, the reaction of the guy, and then they cut away. Not Jaws. Jaws, they show you the enchilada. They show you everything right at the beginning, you know? The terror. And it's a PG movie. It's crazy. All right, next one. Um, Looker. I just reviewed Looker. Uh, it's an important movie to me, even though this last time I watched it was the first time I had watched it since I saw it in the 80s. Um, it used to come on HBO all the time. And I was probably around um, maybe seven, seven years old when this came out. And it was PG, and, and they would play it during the day. And it opens up with nudity. And I was, you know, for a seven-year-old, I was just like, whoa. And uh, I was like... And it's beautiful women. And I was like, whoa, holy crap. (laughs) This is awesome. And I'm like seven years old. And it kind of, it kind of freaked me out. I was like, am I like getting away with something here? Like, do my parents even know about this? You know, because they didn't. And um, I know as superficial as that sounds, that's the memory that I had of this movie is just kind of the shock of how much nudity it had. But then when I went back and watched it, I ended up really liking the story. Michael Crichton, the writer, actually wrote and directed this movie for the screen. And uh, I would say after this recent watch, Halloween 3 is very similar to this movie. And this movie came out before Halloween 3. I think it came out the year before. But the plots are quite similar, actually. And uh, But this is just a memory burned in my brain. Nothing more. Okay, it's just one of those memories that never left me. Okay, and uh, so I had to put it on here. And next one, this is a movie I've seen one time, but um, it just kind of stayed with me. I don't know what it is. It's weird. And I've always wanted to watch it again. I've just never gotten around to it. But um, No Retreat, No Surrender. This is Jean-Claude Van Damme's first movie. If you remember back in the 80s, a lot of martial arts movies were pretty popular, you know? It was the the age of the action hero. And Jean-Claude Van Damme, his gimmick was he would do these splits. But this movie has the weirdest freaking plot ever. This Because there were a lot of bully type movies. I bet this movie was kind of inspired by the Karate Kid. And the, uh, the guy on the right, um, he was being bullied. Uh, and he's like, a, he's like a, um, a martial artist. And I guess he's being bullied by Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, and so he wants to try, cause I've, it's been a long time. I only seen the movie once back in the day. And I think his father was killed or somebody was killed. And so he wanted to get revenge on John Claude Van Damme. John Claude Van Damme's only shown like at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie. And so who trains him? Of course, the ghost of Bruce Lee. You heard that right. The ghost, not, not Bruce Lee because Bruce Lee's dead, but the ghost of Bruce Lee trains this guy to fight Jean-Claude Van Damme. (laughs) I can't make this up. And uh, it was, you know, there were a lot of these movies that had like training montages back then because of Rocky. You know, Rocky inspired so many action movies. 
and um you know you always had to have that training montage in there and it was always fun to watch a good karate uh like martial arts training montage and uh because they would do like they're like doing like like the finger push-ups and you know stuff that's like almost superhuman um but the fight at the end was exciting and I, i the memory of this is i saw this in the theater with a buddy of mine and i was probably maybe 13 14 something like that um mid 80s and um I remember enjoying the hell out of it, but there were only like, you know, four or five of us in the theater. Um, but I guess this movie's kind of just like a, um, a statement of the of the types of movies that were popular in the action genre back then, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a memory that's never left me, you know, for some strange reason. Because um, I think this movie just kind of embodies bad B-level action movies in the 80s because there were tons of them you know this was not an a-level movie this is the low budget the acting's pretty bad you know kind of like canon films even though i don't think this was a canon film but i i love canon films you know so yeah all right so next one next one pulp fiction now this would be on my all-time favorite movies list and This one is on the list because when I saw this movie, it was, you could almost equate it to listening to Nirvana for the first time. You know, there was what, there was the music before Nirvana, and then there was the music after Nirvana. There were movies before Pulp Fiction, and then there were movies after Pulp Fiction. That was the impact that Quentin Tarantino had on the landscape of cinema when this movie came out. It was quite profound movies you could do that in movies you could literally just leave the camera there and let these characters talk about mundane bullshit but somehow it'd be entertaining as hell uh let's and and tarantino stated this the idea of this movie was in every one of these like um where you have these two hitman um hitmen the camera cuts at a certain point what if the camera doesn't cut what if we just follow them for the rest of the day and Listen to, you know, them talk about, you know, restaurants in Europe, you know, the Royale with cheese, you know, or just talk about different bullshit, you know, talk about TV, talk about whatever. Uh, It takes a skilled writer to make that stuff interesting. And boy, was Tarantino. I mean, Pulp Fiction is one of those movies I could throw on any time and just like you could you, you could have it as background noise. It's so freaking fun. But not just that. Also. Just the shifting around of the the actual story. And the story doesn't have to be linear. And I think Tarantino kind of made that popular. Was he the first to do that? No. Hell, Scorsese did that. And I would even say, I think Tarantino borrowed a lot of his ideas from other directors like Scorsese. He's even admitted it. But so many people directors have tried to copy Scorsese, but they don't create their own style their own stamp and that's what tarantino did and you know the next movie that he puts out he's one of the few directors that i will be there i don't even need to know what the movie is i don't even need to see a trailer because it's his name on the movie i will be there day one okay and um pulp fiction is probably one of my probably my favorite of his still to this day i think it's just perfect i hate using that word perfection for movies um, I almost sometimes I like when movies don't have perfection, but there it's one of those movies. There's not a single boring scene in the entire movie, and it always surprises me. Even after I've seen it fifty times, just the reactions of the characters, uh, it, it everything's just so great with Pulp Fiction. All right, next one. I got some big guns in this list, guys. Um, wow, <sighs> gee, I need a minute on this one this this right here is my life like this this is another level okay this this isn't a movie and i know i'm sounding dramatic but i mean just this i don't remember a a moment of my life without rocky you know um i was born in 73 but i i think i started remembering things after rocky came out You know, uh, because our first couple of years in life, there's, uh, we don't remember anything. And, um, 
the character is easily the most in, important character in my life. And uh, I, I would even dare say uh, I wouldn't be who I am today if not for Rocky. Rocky pretty much shaped me as a person. He inspired me. Um, he, he made mistakes that I've learned from. But I've always aspired to be like Rocky. Just like Stallone has, um, he has this saying, he says, if I say it, nobody cares. But if Rocky says it, it's the truth. And he couldn't be more right. You know, Rocky was the type of character that, uh, this was a loan shark. You know, this is a guy that beat up people to get them to pay money. But you can have that, that scene where he's, uh, he doesn't want to hurt the guy. You know, he's, he has such a good heart. But his situation has put him um, in an area where he has to to hit people. You know, he's a boxer because that's the only way he can live. He doesn't have any other skills, you know. And so the, the first Rocky movie is um, at its heart. It's, you know, they always say it's a love story. But to me personally, yeah, it's a love story and it's a beautiful love story. But it's so much more than that, you know. It, it's it's the character himself, and um, what he created with Rocky is pretty much unlike any other character in film history. And I know that's um, a pretty bold statement, but you feel like you know Rocky. You really do. Every time I watch a Rocky movie, it's like revisiting an old friend, you know. And the to be able to write a character like that, I don't even think Stallone realized what he was doing, you know, to, to, to write a character like that. Um, and it just hit everyone, you know. Um, and Stallone's done quite a few interviews on Rocky uh, talking about how, it, it, you know, it was a miracle that it was made. And, um, if, if he had to do it again, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have worked, you know, it, it, everything kind of just lined up and, and, and the timing was perfect. And it, even like the scene where he, he only had one take, you know, and it's the most important scene in the movie, uh, where he's laying on the bed near the end of the movie and he tells Adrian, he can't do it. He can't win. And, you know, that's a bold scene to put in a movie about a guy who, um, you look up to. And, and, and you, you feel like because um, of um, his training and his heart that Rocky could take on a mountain. But there's this one scene in the movie where he's like, I can't do it. I can't beat him. And I don't, I, I don't really, ne- I don't necessarily want to win. I just want to go the distance. And uh, they, they literally had just enough uh, film to, to do one take. And that's the take. He did the one take. And, uh, he got the most important scene in the movie. So everything was just kind of lined, lined right up um, for Rocky. I could talk about Rocky for freaking ever. It's just, it, it, it's always been a part of my life, you know. I, I hold Rocky very high. And, and, and to me, Rocky is the power of cinema, the power of movies and what they can do to you as a person, you know. Um, that, that speech that he says in Rocky Balboa, um, it ain't how hard you hit, it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. I literally used that speech in my retirement uh, retirement speech uh, when I retired from the military. You know, I, I used a speech from Rocky. That's how important he is to me. So, yeah, enough about Rocky, okay? Because <laughs> I, 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 get, I get emotional when I start talking about Rocky. It's the only movie that really gets me that emotional. Um, Shawshank Redemption. Uh, wow, what a, what a freaking movie Shawshank Redemption is. I mean, 1994 is definitely one of the uh, one of the bigger years for movies because you had like Forrest Gump, you had uh, Shawshank Redemption, and you had quite a few other movies that came out that year too. Like I think Speed came out, uh, which is a big hit. Um, but man, as far as like movies that um, are, they inspire hope. You know, because this is a guy that was innocent and he went to prison for 19 years. 
And um, the movie's about being in prison. And no matter where you are, the, the power of the mind and how you can um, rise above it. Because, you know, you could be in prison and you can decide to give up on life. And I think a lot of people probably do that. So this movie is about the the power of the human spirit. And even worse, imagine if you're innocent and you're in prison for 19 years. And he, Andy Dufresne, he concocts this plan uh, to get out of prison. And, and he, he pretty much starts very early on in his stay. And he's, you know, he's, he's patient. So there's a lot of lessons that you can learn from Shawshank Redemption. You can learn about patience. You can learn about friendship because Andy would not be able to get through what he did without Red, um, Morgan Freeman, in the movie. Uh, probably one of the best on-screen friendships I've ever seen. And uh, this movie is just absolutely beautiful. It, it really is. It's crazy that Stephen King wrote this, and it's not a horror movie at all. Um, but it, it, this movie, it, it feels like uh, a good book. You know, it's funny enough. I think this is based on like a short story, but the movie itself is like, I think two and a half hours long, but very rich characters. Uh, and even the smallest character in this movie makes a mark, you know, to me, it should have won best picture, you know, and, uh, but Forrest Gump won best picture I mean, Forrest Gump's a great movie, but man, Shawshank Redemption. That's another one of those movies that I could, I used to watch it like every year, you know? It's, it's like reading a good book. That's what, and I'm not a reader. I don't read books. I watch movies. So this is one of those movies that I could just continually watch over and over and over. So, yeah. I've seen Green Mile. It's, Green Mile's really good. Um, but it ain't Shawshank. It ain't Shawshank. Okay. Next one. Okay. Superman 2. Superman 2. Does that mean Superman 2 is my favorite Superman movie? No. Um, it's. I would say it's probably Man of Steel is probably my favorite Superman movie. But Superman 2 is on this list because it is the very first movie I ever saw in the theater when I was six years old. And uh, it is the movie that made me a Superman fan. Um, I, always, I always say Hulk is my number one and Superman's my number two, but I think they're almost interchangeable. Like, I think they're both number one um i just like everything that superman stood for i mean this is a guy that has so much power like he's he, he, he's like a thousand times powerful than than anyone on on the planet that he's that he's on you know and he chooses to be a good person he chooses to not take advantage you know because he could do that but he chooses to follow the rules of society and to try to make the world a better place you know and to do that when you have that much power, you know, there's a lot of seduction there. Um, and uh, I just remember going to the theater for the first time and seeing Superman 2 and just uh, like, wow, this movie is so freaking great. I loved it to death. I remember like the Niagara Falls scene, you know, when the kid falls and he like flies down there to get him. But I think this scene right here was the scene that I loved the most when um, General Zod and his henchmen, you know, Superman, he gave up his powers. He gave up his powers for Lois. And then, you know, the lesson here is that, um, uh, I guess with great power comes great responsibility. There's no other way to say it. You know, when you have that much power and people depend on you, you have to put on, put aside your personal needs. And so he has to give up the woman that he loves because the world needs him. And so the scene where, you know, it's been a long time. And, you know, that scene where he goes to um, the Fortress of Solitude. And, man, when he screams out, you know, Chris Reeve's performance is just beautiful. Father! You know, he's just screaming for his father. And uh, he's pretty much given up, you know, because they told him, if you give up your powers, you can't have them back. And so he has to go back and beg for his powers. And so then when he comes back, you see the newspaper just kind of fly away. And then he flies in. And then the music, John Williams' beautiful freaking score. General Zod, would you care to step outside? <laughs> I remember the, th I still remember this. The theater lost it. You know, he's back. And uh, I know, I didn't even know all the drama between Richard Donner 
and uh, Warner Brothers and and all that back then. I was six years old. I just loved the movie. And I found out years and years and years later that there was another cut, the Donner cut. But the, the, the Lester cut always has my heart because it's the movie I saw in the theater. And it was the first movie I ever saw in the theater. So, yeah. So, Superman 2. Superman 2. Fractal. Remember, King Kong was on the last list. All right? King Kong was on the last list. Okay. All right. We're moving. We're moving. Uh, next one. Um, to Live and Die in L.A. This might be a movie that a lot of you guys haven't seen. Um, now this was... I saw this, I, I think, in the 80s. I think it came out in the late 80s. And I, I put it on this list because this was the first time that I wasn't, like, I guess, seduced by the popular movie, you know, of the day. Uh, this is the first time I I th- I learned the lesson to hey give give other movies that everybody isn't talking about a chance because you might end up liking them and you might end up loving them and that's what happened with this movie To Live and Die in L.A. Um, one thing was like Willem Dafoe was a it was a really great villain and there's a scene in this movie where they pretty much show you step by step how to counterfeit money back in the eighties. And I always found that scene really interesting, but also, you know, uh, William Peterson is not like, you know, your normal leading man, right? He He's not Tom Cruise. He's not Sylvester Stallone. He's, he's more of like almost a character actor, but he really leads the charge beautifully uh, in this movie. And um, yeah, Wang Chung, man, I love the song to live and die in LA too. Uh, this movie totally feels like 80s. It has one of the best car chases, uh, on-screen car chases I've ever seen because he's having to drive against traffic. It might not be the first movie to ever do that, but man, it's a great scene. Uh, and, you know, they... they I, and, oh, by the way, William Friedkin, who directed The Exorcist, directed this movie. And man, is it beautifully directed. And because a lot of you haven't probably seen this, uh, yeah, burning money naked. Yeah, <laughs> um, but because a lot of you people haven't probably seen this, I'll say the ending has such a crazy twist that I did not see coming whatsoever. Rosalia running scared. Yes, running scared is excellent. Excellent, loved it. it came out around the same time as this movie too. There were a lot of these type movies that came that nobody was talking about. Another one was like True Believer with James Woods. It's a lawyer. I love good lawyer movies. And that was one of those movies that no one was talking about. And it was really, really good, you know, with a nice twist at the end. But this is one of my favorite twist endings. Um, Just, it's like a holy shit, you know, one of those type endings. Did not see that coming at all. Yeah, uh, we're not talking about the Paul Walker running scared. We're talking about another one. Was it um, Jeff... Rosalia, what's the actor's name? Um, Je- is it Jeffrey? He was a dancer. He was in White Nights. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, To Live and Die in L.A. I cannot recommend it enough. It's so freaking good. Okay. Next one, of course, American Psycho. Um, when I saw this movie, it was one of those movies I thought, um, man, this is great. Nobody's ever going to see it. That, that was my thought process at the time. Um, it came out in 2000. And it was just one of the most unique. Like, is it a slasher? I guess it's kind of a slasher. But it's more of a, a character study of a completely psychotic uh, person. But, man, the, the as far as, like, building a character, Patrick Bateman is literally like uh, Hershey's Chocolate. You know what I mean? He's just like... Uh, he. What's what, what what do you think of when you like when you eat chocolate? It's like dopamine, right? And Patrick Bateman, he's just so freaking fun to watch. Uh because he does and says things that are completely insane. And I, I would even wager that he probably does and says things that sometimes we might want to say and do. Um I, we don't want to kill people, but um or do we? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I can't do this, but you know what? I'm going to put on this guy that can do it for two hours and just kind of enjoy that. That's what Patrick Bateman is. It's it's different than, 
any other horror movie that I've ever seen. And it's probably one of the, the greatest horror characters ever created. And uh, again, when I first saw this movie, I thought I had this great secret that nobody, like, because nobody was talking about American Psycho when it first came out. And I was just like, God, this movie's so freaking good. And I should have known because eventually it just started building and building and then everybody was talking about American Psycho. Um, and it's one of those movies that's so good, it's so good that I can't, like, you, you don't want them to make a sequel, right? And they made a sequel and I never even bothered to watch it, you know, because it would almost taint how great the first American Psycho is, you know? Don't you dare make a sequel to this movie. You know, it's almost a crime. You know, this movie is perfection in every, every sense. It's one of those movies like I'm scared to even review it because of how damn perfect it is, okay? And so I put this movie on here because of how fucking perfect American Psycho is, okay? And and I, I'd say Patrick Bateman might be one of my all-time favorite characters. He, he, he's just, because you can just study this guy, you know? There's not too many characters like Patrick Bateman. They've tried to copy that formula of a character many times since, I think. Uh, and it's one of those characters that if you don't fully commit to it, then you're probably going to fall on your face, you know? And there's just so many funny little antidotes about American Psycho. Just little things like his, his morning routine, um, how he exercises to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, uh, how... In the book, by the way, guys, I don't know if they mentioned it in the movie, but in the book, his favorite movie is Body Double. The, the last catalog review I did, Body Double, that's Patrick Bateman's favorite movie. It's I think he mentions it like 30 times in the book, okay? Brian De Palma, Body Double. I should have put that on here, but I, I, then that's just too many movies. And uh, Born to be Rad would kill me. Okay, not another freaking movie. You know, I can't do another list. All right, so yeah. American Psycho, baby. Hell yeah. Okay, next one. Can anybody tell me what that movie is? I bet you can't. I bet you can't. But man, is it important to me. I love this movie to death. All right, I'm going to give it a couple seconds to see if anybody can guess this movie. I guarantee you, nobody's going to be able to guess it. Sean G got it. Guys, I have a recommendation for you. Um, this is, um, um, God, John Ritter, Jesus, John Ritter is the main character of this movie. And I love this character to death. This is one of the funniest comedies I've ever seen, but it definitely has, um, some sadness to it and a lot of heart. Um, his name is Zachary Hutton. The character's name is Zachary Hutton. Okay. And that picture pretty much sums up <laughs> his life, okay? I want you to study this picture, okay? Zachary Hutton, <laughs> this is the beginning of the movie. <laughs> I'm laughing just thinking about this scene. Beginning of the movie, he has been caught, okay? Um, but what's funny about the beginning of this movie is he's caught by the woman with the gun to his head. And you think that's his wife, but no. Because that woman caught him with another woman. All right, because he's a nymphomaniac. And then his real wife comes in after. And uh, she she's just like you can you can pretty much tell what their marriage has been like just by this this opening scene, because she literally tells her if you're going to shoot him, could you at least do it out in the yard? <laughs> and that's the opening of the movie. And immediately, I, I want to know more about this character, okay? I want to follow this character for two hours, and I want to see what the hell his life is about, okay? And he is this very famous writer in the movie, and uh, he has, like, writer's block. And he is, you know, he's like a nymphomaniac. And like, if he sees a beautiful woman walking down the road, he, he, he can't control himself, you know? He, he has the best intentions. And I think that's why we like these types of characters so much, these characters that have a good heart, they have the best of intentions. They don't want to hurt people, but they have a weakness, you know, almost like a drug addict. They have they have this disease and they just cannot help themselves. And then w when you take that idea and you make it one of the funniest movies ever because of the situations that this guy gets into, there's no other comedy like this. There never before or since. Skin Deep is a gift and nobody's seen it. That's that's what I love about this movie. It's like all my it's like my own personal little gift that nobody will ever see. 
and it, it, oh my god it's so freaking funny it's so freaking funny the the scene that this movie is famous for you might know you like the scene is so famous but you might not have seen the movie and it's the glow in the dark condom scene it's the glow in the dark condom scene what that is zachary has gotten himself in trouble <laughs> he, he he's in this hotel and long story short he hooks up with this girl and she was dating this rock star right and that all they do is fight and so zachary he's he's not like a, a loud guy he's a writer he's intelligent he woos her so <laughs> the scene is so freaking funny so she has these glow-in-the-dark condoms and the lights are off so the screen is black and then he comes out of the bathroom all you see is the glow-in-the-dark condom let i think it's green <laughs> And he's walking out and the condom is just <laughs> like that. Through the... And so then her boyfriend enters the frame in a different colored condom because he wants to surprise her. <laughs> okay. That scene is so freaking hilarious. So there's this film is just filled with scenes like that, that like there's very few comedies where your, your sides are literally hurting from laughing so hard. This is one of those comedies for me. I would say like Step Brothers, um, um, uh, Anchorman, stuff like that. But this is a very different type of movie. There's actually a lot of heart to this movie. You want this guy to succeed. You know, you want him to to um, get better from this affliction. But man, is it funny following him and, and seeing him like just completely fall on his face all the way through the movie. Um, the The script is so um witty you know really great writing in this so guys if you haven't seen skin deep definitely check it out okay all right is that the last one that's the last one we did it we did it all right born to be rad man thank you guys for um for um doing this tag creating this tag i i like i said in the first video this is the first time i've done a tag in like seven years and when I saw the idea, I was just like, God, I got to jump on that. I, I want to tell my story. Because that's literally what you're doing. It, it, you're, you're telling your cinematic story when you do this list. And I think that's why it caught on, you know? And I think it's going to keep catching on. But, yeah. So, that was fun. That was really fun. What's up, guys? You are at the end of the DD Live clip. Uh, what I do is I like to clip these out if I think the, the topic is important or something that's newsworthy. So thank you for watching. And uh, if you want to watch more, you can you can go over here. You can go over here. Click on one of those. And uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully I can do this for 20 seconds, which I think I did. Okay, so yeah. Thanks for watching, guys.